Tonight on After Dark. Dark Matter's very own 2 and 3, along with Trisha Ennis, join Zoe Palmer as they break down what happened on episode 6. The alternates come to town. 6 goes MIA. And 3 rekindles with an old flame. Plus a sneak peek at a clip from next week's episode. So don't get spaced. After Dark starts right now. I'm Zoe Palmer, and this week Melissa O'Neill and Anthony Lemke are back to talk about the ruthless duo Portia Lynn and Marcus Boone. Welcome back, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Also joining us again is Trisha Ennis from Sci-Fi Wire. Trisha, I'm going to start with you. Let's hear your take on the episode of The Alternates. Well, everybody likes a good uh, alternate version of, uh, of the characters that we all know and love, especially darker, more... Um CD versions, I guess. What's that like? Are you a good scene partner with yourself? <laughs> I am, but uh, it's actually um, Kirsten Hinton who plays my double, who you do the scenes with. So you're always you're always acting opposite a, a human being, and she's a fantastic actor. So it's it's easy with her. I'm afraid I had to restrain them. Oh, I restrained your crew member as well. I also found it necessary to gag him. Understandable. Yeah. 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 Who was your person? A tennis ball. You had a tennis ball? Yeah, we, we got to act opposite tennis balls. <laughs> Clearly, there's tennis something balls. in your contract that we don't have in I get ours. humans, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, humans, we, don't, we, get we, don't, we don't get Which humans. is ironic, <laughs> since I play, you know, an android. Yeah. 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 So, <laughs> on the first episode of After Dark, we spoke with Joe about the theme of redemption and identity. How do the alternate characters' identities fit into that theme? I like to think that their story purpose in the context of dark matter helps to illustrate identity in that those those two, three, six, four, like they were all certain people that made decisions based off of that start moment from when they regain their consciousness. And to see who these people were prior to that really helps to differentiate, okay, so are we destined to repeat the same things? Are, are, are we actually just meant to be who we're meant to be? Or given different circumstances and different surrounding people, can we change? You also have to want to be redeemed if you are gonna, yeah. So in a hypothetical battle of violence between two and Portia and Boone and three, do you think that uh, two and three could take him out? I want to root, of course I'm rooting for two. I believe in rooting for the good guy, but I think Portia would fight dirty and she would do anything. Do you feel like two would be more motivated because she actually cares? I think two has too much emotional baggage. So think, you see her as would, weaker then? Portia. I don't see her as weaker. I see her as having emotional baggage. I don't think that's weak. And then she'd lose. Maybe. Potentially. That doesn't make you weak. <laughs> she's trying to get okay, at the essence of what we're... She's not weak, even though she loses. This is, this is, Gets I, killed. This is my relationship with Lemke. What, he goes, what do you think? And I'm like, I'm of two minds. Like, you gotta pick one. <laughs> Behind the scenes with Anthony Lemke. Those of you who remember season one, well, remember this space. Come on down here, you'll see these massive doors at the end. These were the vault doors. That's it? I think that's as open as they're gonna get. The vault was on the other side of these doors, but the way we did that was pretty easy. We put a massive green screen in behind here where I'm standing now. And then we flipped it all around and created the vault inside this room. So both the vault and the exterior of the vault are actually the same room. If we get to a season four, I think this will be repurposed. So watch out for that in season four. And then you'll know, you'll say, oh, that's what happened to the underbelly. It turned into that set. So uh, your showrunner, Joe Malazzi, likes to turn to the audience for a lot of uh, input on the show. And I'm wondering, like, working through that creative process, do you guys get a lot of input into your characters? Well, early on in the first season, it, would, it seemed that the input that I got into my character was, you're an ass, <laughs> generally speaking. Um, and then episode seven came along, and I was less of an ass. So obviously, uh, somebody listened, and uh, it worked. One of the things mm -hmm. that he taught me this season was about how you can you can plant seeds with anybody who's writing a script, really, because they, they have their ideas and they have the structure of what they're going to be running with, but every once in a while, there's like a little nugget. They're like, that's actually not a bad idea. Well, we'll use it. You will, like, absolutely yeah. put it in. I've rarely worked in a show that's as collaborative as this, and I think, you know, all working on the same page to create a better show, so... Uh, but that starts with an openness from up top. Do you think there's a chance for uh, two and um, three to uh, two and three it up? Wow, that's the question for Joe. Moving on, and <laughs> after all of that, which would look something. You like that one? No. Like that. <laughs> no, I, well, we did first off, and it went this way. Yeah, that's yeah. right because I got I got like zombie space zombie infection. You were like, 
Get away from me. Yeah, yeah well, that is a bit that. of a turn off. I mean, bring that over yeah, here. Yeah, bring that over well, here. Virus. The thing that was going through his head was that you survived, but would I? You equated that zombie bite to a very serious illness, as I recall. I, that's right. <laughs> One of the things that um, Three's been dealing with recently is that he now is fully aware that Sarah is in the computer. You're building yourself a whole world here, aren't you? It's not just for me. I want you to be happy when you're here. I am. What is he thinking when he's in there with the digital consciousness of his girlfriend? Uh, that's what he's thinking. My girlfriend is a digital consciousness. <laughs> Isn't that a little weird? Uh, there's a lot of relationships, particularly this season, and I think it's going to grow into even more so next season, where I think Joe and Paul are playing with the limits of what is acceptable. I think that's kind of what makes a cohesive society, the fact that we actually do have limits about what is acceptable and what isn't. And, and what we are doing on this show is saying, w let's test those limits. Um, onto the fact that yeah. we've lost six. Do you think that there's anybody that could take over that position, especially when it comes to five, in terms of like protecting her or looking out for her? Yeah. Or is Everyone yeah. does that. Even when Rio and five cross paths, he has that energy towards her. And I think that's kind of like the charm of that character is everyone wants to take care of her. For three, I think there's, there's an equality as well. I mean, it's, it's actually a relationship that's always changing. Almost like sometimes she's the mom and I'm the kid. And, yeah. Or we're brother, sister, or yeah. I'm the uncle who's, you know, up to no good. All these weird, complex elements to that relationship. I enjoy it immensely, that relationship. Weapons of Dark Destruction. My name is Lisa Amaral Wright, and I am the uh, on-floor key prop person. Obviously, our main cast have their standard weapons. Number two, Melissa, had what we call a Duran Duran. We also added the Sears gun. Anthony, who plays number three, is the gun guy. So this is a variety of our versions of Bubba. It's Bubba time. Who's Bubba? This is Bubba. One of those is actually a rubber, but just because of the size of Bubba, none of the versions of Bubba are light. Number four, obviously, his main weapon of choice was his sword, even though he still had a gun. And this is number six, a shotgun. He doesn't use it as much as he used to, but it, it has made an appearance a couple of times. Hey there. That's probably the, the most fun, is everyone getting together and coming up with what you see here. So, so we were talking another episode ago about the fact that Anthony is a lawyer mm -hmm. and that Roger, well, you are. Technically, I went to law school and I went and worked at a law firm, but I'm not actually called to the bar. But now at least I've done the disclaimer. Right, so Anthony's a lawyer and Roger Cross is a pilot. Is there anything that uh, we don't know about you? Um, yes, I've only had one other job. Oh, go on. Uh, um, um, and, and that is uh, singing and doing musical theater. Ten, oh, God, it's all coming back to me. You won Canadian Idol. Oh, hey, oh, hey, oh. Hey, oh. Yeah, Let's there sing. we go. Yeah, the very first one, right? No, no it, was the, the, it was the third one. Third and that one. is a healthy 12 years ago now. And then, uh, you know, I have to bring this up only because there was much debate about it. The kiss between Nix and... Oh, right. Ghost Nix, I should there say. There was much. Ghost Nix. Hang on. And okay. He's already, he's already <laughs> wearing the ghost. I'm reliving it. She's like, yeah, I'm right anyway, not. The I'm girls so kiss each other ready. and that's all the time. So, there's a kiss mm -hmm. between the two of you and the conversation is what, what essentially was that? To me, as two is losing consciousness, she's losing oxygen, she's, she's hallucinating. And when she leans in for a kiss, I mean, I think that it was ambiguous enough that we can either assume that it was romantic, but in, in my heart, it was, it was a goodbye between friends. And um, I think everyone has had that goodbye kiss before, and it can happen on the lips. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> How many times have you kissed your friends on the lips? Well, in university, quite a bit. <laughs> There but, is, there but the is. point is, you have to weigh in on this one. As someone who's not an actor, okay, I, for what it's worth, when you saw the scene, I was anticipating the moment. Ooh, you were. Yes. You were anticipating. Yeah, it. No, I kind of assumed it was going to happen. I actually do agree with them that it wasn't romantic. That it was sort Could of, have been. it was sort of wasn't. two taking some sort of strength from Nix as a person. That said, I did ship it, so I understand that people might want to read more into that, and I would love to see a same-sex relationship on the show. So, it's so nice. great, yeah. Okay, that's all we have time for tonight. Now here's an exclusive sneak peek at next week's Dark Matter episode. Maybe you're not so different now. 
I mean, you're still obsessed with doing the right thing, and you're pretty bad at weighing the costs. To us. To your family. To the outer colonies that declared their independence. Time's running out for them. You think I don't know that? I want to warn them, but I can't. Like hell you can't. There's a no-go directive in place. Well, screw the directives. Listen to yourself. You're sitting there, you're belly aching about all the mistakes you've made, how you want to take them all back. How about just making the right call in the first place? This is the right call. Is that what you thought when you turned your back on us? Thanks everyone for watching. If you want more, check out your local sci-fi website. Thanks to Melissa and Anthony and Trisha for joining and having some fun. See you next time, after dark. Bye. <laughs>